We're going to get our class started and just a minute. I'm going to ask uh, Robbie if you'll lead us in the opening prayer. But before we do that, we'll have our uh, we'll have our scripture reading. But I wanted to pose a question to you before we did our scripture reading. Uh, found this one. It's a kind of a thought-provoking question. I'm not sure how I'd answer. You're hiking with uh, with some friends. And as you round the side of a small hill, the group notices 30 or 40 sedimentary layers in the side of a rocky bank. One of your friends dislodges two rocks, one from high up and one from lower down in the bank, holds the stones out at arm's length and says, isn't it amazing that this rock I'm holding in my right hand is millions of years older than the rock I'm holding in my left hand? What do you say? How do you respond? Yeah. So the rock at the top Rock older than the rock at the bottom. No, there's oh, millions right. of years difference. Ah, oh, I see. Ah, 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 millions okay. of years difference. Oh, so what makes you think that? What makes you think that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Did you remember the flood? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it is interesting. Mm -hmm. The class is very interesting to study these things, but putting them into into practice when we get into those situations. What do we say? Hopefully today we'll have some some more things to think about it. What do we say as we kind of dig into the geological column and look at that very aspect of these rocks and their ages and how they got to where they got. And before we have our scripture reading, Elijah, do you want to read that for us? Genesis chapter 1, 9 and 10. We're we'll talking a lot about dry land today. Robbie, I'll let you lead us in opening prayer. Will we? Sure. Our gracious Father in heaven, thank you for this day. We're so thankful for uh, being here and, and uh, having the opportunity to glorify you in song and in prayer and, and going to your word and learning more about it. We're just so thankful that we can remember your son's death on the cross this day and, and the sacrifice that he gave for each uh, one of us. And, the hope of heaven through this sacrifice that we have. We just pray that uh, you're with Kyle's father, and we just pray that uh, the people that are ministering to him uh, uh, help him uh, recover from uh, this accident. Uh, we just ask you to be with those that are traveling this day, the ones that are maybe sick or uh, uh, just not doing well, and we just pray that you're with them. Um, be with Kyle today as he delivers our message, and we just pray that we uh, take the thoughts that he has uh, worked on and that we, uh, we take that to heart and we, we try to do better as Christians. We just love you and we thank you for your son who died for us on the cross. We pray for in Christ's name. Amen. Kyle, I wanted to say something. Mm -hmm. This class has taught me one thing, okay. that God is in control and he is all knowing and all doing. Yeah. And it just, it just reaffirms and if I go, mm -hmm. okay, that rock looks like it's older, God can do marvelous things. Yeah, absolutely. And I, it's not a cop out. It's, right. You know, he says, I, "My thoughts are higher than your thoughts." Yeah. Yeah. Paul tells us he that he can do more than we can, exactly. we can think exactly. or imagine. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Absolutely right. Absolutely. All right. As, as Don Alexander tells me once, when you're studying with someone, if they don't believe the Bible, then where do you start? Yeah. 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 We have to have. Have to have some common ground. Yes. So yes. the the challenge then is when we have those who don't believe the Bible, um, we do have to start somewhere. Yes. And while we can't, there, there's no place that we can start. Um, there may not be a place where we can start theologically. There may not be a place we can start that is where we're, we're in agreement on terms of the Bible and God dealing with someone who doesn't believe with that. There are places where we can start that are, uh, where we can find common ground. For example, the, um, the, the illustration, well not even the illustration that I use, I, mean, I can talk about a real life example. Robbie and his neighbor have a shared fascination of, of nature and the, the power, the, or the, the, the awesomeness that you see in, in the creation around you. They both share that. We, there's a place we can start. You may not have an agreement on God in the slightest, but we can have an agreement on this. Let's start here. 
I'm sort of talking about these things. Yeah. What, that's, that, that the environment is awesome? Is that where you start? I think, yeah, I think that would be, that's a <laughs> wonderful place to start. If we, if I do not, uh, if I'm dealing with someone who does not believe in God, yeah. I think the temptation sometimes is, well, there's just nothing we can do. But what we can do is find a place where we have common ground and say, well, let's build a relationship on that. And I'm going to tell you why I think nature is awesome, because I believe in a God who created it. Right. And maybe you don't agree with me on that, but I'm happy to tell you why I think that, and I'm happy to still love you and serve you, even though you don't agree with me. Right. Right. And that's not a, obviously not going to be you know, foolproof. Right. Uh, the greatest servant of all time got crucified. So we shouldn't expect that just because we're treating them with love and compassion that they're going to, to come and see things that we see them. But at the very same time, uh, that's the example that's been set for us. So I don't oh, know yeah. what else. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know what absolutely. else we can do. Yeah. Well, I know my neighbor, um, he's constantly amazed at um, the, uh, the gratitude and the love that he's seen through I guess me, but also the men that came and helped with our uh, uh, mulching our blueberries and how impressed he was with the, the young men, the older men that worked that day. And just, he said he's, he's never really seen that. Right, right. And so there's, there's opportunity to touch upon those type of things. He is very impressed with nature. Uh, a lot of people in society, it seems like they take nature for granted. They don't really see because they're so caught up in their own lives and their own, you know, wants. Uh, but at times, everyone sees something in nature that they're totally blown away with. It could be the aurora borealis that happened a month ago. It could be just, you know, the selfies they're taking with a mountain in the background or whatever. Um, and that's an awakening. And I think with my neighbor, I think the more he thinks about all these aspects of nature, the more he's thinking, this can't happen by accident. You know, it's just, Kyle's told me I need to be patient. <laughs> so, he got that from Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't an original thought. No, it wasn't. <laughs> you don't want any original thoughts from me. All right, we're going to get into the geological column today. Geological column is a structure that represents the, the theory of uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism is that all that we see in the in, in rocks and sediment and igneous layers, uh, all of that was created at a, a similar rate um, over, over billions of years. Um, do you know, let me ask you this question here, I'll uh, Put the, this is the, uh, the geological column, and it's, when, when I say geological column, what we're talking about is different layers of rock. And so uh, we've got um, the uh, Cenozoic era, and that's a, a layer of rocks that goes from 65 million years ago all the way up to present day. And you have different layers within that, uh, tertiary and quaternary, and all these different layers that say this is... Um, so far back in history, so far back in history, we go back, we get to layers that we're probably more familiar with when we think of rock layers, such as the Cretaceous, Jurassic, Triassic. You'll hear people say this is from the Triassic Age. What they're saying is we found a fossil, or we found an artifact, something that is in a rock level, a rock layer from the geological column that dates to this Triassic period, which is 200 to um, 250 million years ago. So, my question for you is, where can we go? Where's the one place you can go on the earth and see the entire geologic column represented? So the Grand Canyon, good answer, Robbie. The Grand Canyon is wrong. It's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good answer because it's my, it has my answer too. Is that my first thought is surely in the Grand Canyon we can see every layer of the geological column. And you can see several layers of the geological column. You, have a, a, a lot of different, when you look at the Grand Canyon, you see all those lines, the striations, and as you get down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, it's really crazy because everything is, is so almost perfectly horizontal. 
And when you get to the bottom, it's almost like they're coming up and down. They, there's a lot of really wild rock formations that are changing as you get lower down. But you can't see all of this geological column at the Grand Canyon. There's only one place on the entire planet where you can go and see all of the geological column. And that's in his textbook. Because it doesn't exist. That's okay. in literature oh, alone. Yeah, other than I can't remember it. <laughs> and I love a trick question. The only place you can find this is in textbooks. It's theoretical. It is not. Uh, so what they have done is they've dug on this part of the earth, and they've dug in this part of the earth, and they they go, okay, this is we're we're in this layer over here, and then we're going to assume that that layer over here is on the same thing. So we'll go dig deeper over here, and it's it is completely theoretical um, that there is layers of sediment and igneous rock is not in question at all. But the way that they have organized them in this geological column and the dates that they have assigned to them is the, the issue that we have. Um, as I said, the geological column suggests that sediment was laid down at a uniform and equivalent rate as it is today. So sediment, uh, sandstone, limestone, uh, your harder igneous rocks are laid down and stacked upon each other as they as, as things occur throughout history to, to cause that to happen. Water, it plays a really big part in this water, pushing things down. And, uh, as all that happens, you have these different layers that are being compressed. There's a lot of pressure on them, pushing them down. And this is where we get the idea of fossils. Now, before I get into that, apparently I had another chart I wanted to show you. So, this is, uh, this is some of our, our, when we talk about geological periods, this is the way that we have kind of broken this up. So, the most recent strata, the most, when I say strata, we're talking about a, a, a layer of, of sediment and rock. The recent strata goes from present day backwards to about 1.8 million years. After that, we'll get into the Cenozoic, which is 5 to 70 million years, the Mesozoic, 70 to 200 million years, uh, and then we get to an interesting time. You have the Paleozoic, which includes something called the Cambrian period. We're going to talk about the Cambrian period a little bit, because in this range from two, 200 to 530 million years ago, we have a lot of fossil record, but after the Cambrian range, so we get to pre-Cambrian. Cambrian is the very, very bottom of the Paleozoic. So when we get to the bottom of that, we enter into the Proterozoic, pre-Cambrian age, and all of a sudden, our fossil record changes quite a bit. We're gonna talk about that in our class today. So that's 530 million to 1 billion, and then one, uh, this says one to 1.8, but really one and beyond. One billion and beyond is the uh, Archaeozoic, and that's another pre-Cambrian age. So, as I said, this is where we start discovering fossils. So what is a fossil? What is a fossil? Anybody want to give an answer to that? Any remains from an animal or plant. Any remains from an animal or plant. It is a, the remains of a, live, of a once living organism. Um, I, I don't think I, I mentioned it in the last class, but I had a, uh, Michael Ray shared a very funny story about Hogan not being able to be convinced that plants were living. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they weren't walking in yeah. <laughs> but despite what Hogan believes of fossils include plants because plants were once living organisms so any living organism that has died and then either through mineralization its, its structures are preserved or through imprintation so it leaves an imprint in these soils and these sediments that they are compressed down uh, and we got kind of a an illustration of that here, Miss Caroline tried to find the cutest <laughs> skeleton structure of a Tyrannosaurus Rex as I could. But we see in, in this illustration, you can see all the different layers, and, and this is, you know, we'll, we'll find that this is not exactly representative of how this is because they're not left standing up and they're not buried under different layers. They'll be flat. You know, they fall, they die, they fall over. And so you'll find a, uh, th this skeleton laying flat in a, in a sedimentary layer. We dig down to that layer, we discover it, and that's how we can kind of, that's how the geological column and the fossil record work together. Say, okay, this, this is about this old because we found it in this, this rock layer. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in this class as well. 
So there's some assumptions. The geological column presents some assumptions that must be true for evolution to be, to be confirmed through this. And when I say evolution, again, I'm talking about macroevolution. I hope we're getting very comfortable with that word, macroevolution. In, in the next couple of classes, we're going to introduce another type of evolution, uh, which is becoming somewhat prominent as people try to deal with some of the very things that we've been bringing up in this class. So macroevolution requires that the oldest geological layers will contain the earliest and the most undeveloped forms of life. So in our geological column, the deeper you go, the, or the oldest layers, you're going to find undeveloped and, and non-complex, very simple creatures at that age because evolution hasn't had time to make complex and, and develop life forms. But as we move further up into the youngest layers, we're going to find more developed and more complex forms. That's going to be our, that's how we know evolution is happening because we have undeveloped and we have more developed. And in the mean, there will be details of transitional fossils that show how we were going from undeveloped to developed, simple to complex. These assumptions must be found to be true for macroevolution to be confirmed. But there's also assumptions for creation that must be found to be true. If you're going to hold a creation, we should assume that there will be a sudden appearance of life forms that are fully formed. And we will find those sudden appearances scattered throughout the geological uh, layers. In different layers, we'll find an appearance of life forms that are completely developed. We will also find that in the very oldest layers, we would assume that there would be no life because those layers were created before animals and plants. We believe that. We read that in Genesis 1, that God created the waters and then he divided the waters from the dry land. And it's after that that he creates our things that can make themselves into fossils. We would also find that in some of those early, early layers, that we would expect to find a lot of fossils of things that would evidence a great catastrophe like the flood. Things that were trying to escape the flood but couldn't, maybe. We would expect to find that. That's an assumption that must be true for creation. And also, we would assume that there will be no transitional fossils. Otherwise, it would make, not, it would make a lot of sense. God made something and said it was good, but it's not done yet. So I'm going to work. So these, these are the assumptions for creation. When I say assumptions, I, I mean that's exactly what we are assuming. We are assuming by believing in creation that this will be the case. And macroevolutionists are assuming by believing in macroevolution that their assumptions will be found to be true. And so now we dig. Now we start searching through the geological column. And what we find is fossils, and what we recognize is the truth about the history and about which one of these views and which one of these assumptions are true is, in, is inherently tied to what these fossils say. That is our only answer. We can't come up with an answer from chemistry. We cannot come up with an answer from anywhere else. It must come from the fossil. And when I say that, that's not me that believes in creation talking, that's evolutionists. Stephen M. Stanley says we must look to the fossil record for the ultimate documentation of large-scale change. In the absence of the fossil record, the credibility of evolutionists would be severely weakened. We might wonder whether the doctrine of evolution would qualify as anything more than an outrageous hypothesis. So what Mr. Stanley was saying is, for this to be true, we have to find evidence for it in the fossil record. That is, that is the only way that we can confirm our hypothesis, that we can move from hypothesis to fact. And so if that's true for them, it's also, there's also a sense where that's true for us as well. We must find evidence in the fossil record for our claims of creation. Uh, another one, Pierre Paul Grassi, who was a scientist but also a, an artist. So someone who would, they, would, we would think, okay, we found the fossil, we want someone to kind of help us define what that fossil might have looked like, draw, you know, make drawings for it. He says, naturalists must remember that the process of evolution is revealed only through fossil forms. See, so we're going to talk about evolution, and we're going to entertain evolution, which Pierre 
Paul, uh, he, he, um, he was an evolutionist. He believed in evolution. He thought evolution was the answer. Um, he said, we're going to have to find the evidence for that in the fossil record. That's the only place we're going to find it. Uh, and then this guy, Charles Darwin, he was a big proponent of this as well. I think he believed in evolution. He said the number of intermediate and transitional links, transitional links is the, the, the fossils that we find that are evidence that something simple was transitioning to something complex. The number of intermediate and transitional links between all living and extinct species must have been inconceivably great. He's saying, what he's saying is, I can't wait for us to dig down in this fossil record because we're going to find all of these transitional fossils and there must be several of them. Now, let me, before we go on, talk about some tricky logic. And we'll get more into this at the close of our, of our quarter uh, as we think of some of the, the ways in which people who hold to evolutionary belief will sometimes debate and the, the logic that they will use. So, I've got a, a comic up here. Ms. Carroll says, this, it's, it's two boys that are, that are talking, and one of them looks like he's holding maybe a Bible, and the other one's holding a, a fish, a skeleton of a fish, and they've been digging in some dirt. So this fossil is three billion years old, says the one holding the fish. The one holding the Bible says, well, how do you know? And so the one with the fossil says, well, it was in this rock strata. It was, I, I got it out of this piece of rock here. And so the one with the Bible says, well, how can you be certain of the age of the rock strata? And he said, because there's a three billion year old fossil in it. <laughs> that is what we call circular logic. Circular. Circular logic. logic. I, a, a, I use that a lot. Uh, use circular <laughs> logic a lot. We, you know, we hear it in other places as well. I was telling Robbie uh, just a couple weeks ago about a story when we were visiting Holly and I uh, and the boys were at the Cincinnati Zoo. And as I'm walking, I think I was walking with my brother-in-law. We're walking and we got, it was just tickled me so much. When this little girl walking in front of us with her mom looks over and sees this very large pink bird and says, what is that? And her mom says, it's a flamingo. And the little girl walks a little bit further. You can tell she was thinking over and she said, mom, what's a flamingo? And the mom went, it's that. Big bird. It's, it's, it's that right there. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the only answer she had to give her. So this sort of circular logic is common in the use of geological record and fossils together. So what I have here, um, what I thought I had here, uh, here we go, the trilobite. The trilobite is what we call a indexing fossil. We know how old trilobites are. And let's, uh, I've, I've, I may have wrote it down, but let's say that the age of a trilobite is 300 million years old. Um, yes, the trilobite is used to date fossils in the range of 390 to 500 million years old. So, we know, we look at the trilobite, we say, okay, this is a, a 400 to 500 million year old fossil. So, if it's found in this rock, the rock must be 400 to 500 million years old as well. Uh, this is the kind of circular logic that is sometimes used. We know the rock is that old because we know the fossil is that old. We know the fossil is that old because we know the rock is that old. So, we need to be aware of that logic as we go into this. Now, and, and what this really equates to is heads, you know, flip a coin, Heads I win, tails you lose. That's really what we're kind of dealing with. There is no way for you to defeat this, even though it's self-defeating in a sense that it doesn't actually prove anything. Uh, and this sort of this sort of um, characteristic, this sort of uh, attitude of dating rocks this way, even some evolutionists have come out to say, "Hey, this is not helping us." Not only in it. And they're not really saying, like, hey, this makes us look back to the creationists. That's not what they're saying. They're saying we really are wanting the truth. Like, we really do want to know what happened. And that sort of thinking is, it gives us, it leaves room for error. It leaves room for us to make mistakes. And that's not good for the truth. So there, there's a lot of, uh, there, there's a lot of people. I don't bring this up to say, like, oh, this is the, the gotcha. It's not what this is. But we do need to be aware that this is sort of how some of this has come about. 
And when you hear someone say, well, this rock has to be 300 million years old because it contains these fossils in it. Um, that would be a good question. Ever. How do you know those fossils are that old? If it's because they're in that rock, how do you know that rock? You can't use both of those as your, as your marker. Uh, and we'll see a little bit more about that as we go on. So, what exactly does the geological column and the fossil record teach us? That's what we're going to talk about in, this, in the remainder of this class. What exactly do we learn from these things? The first thing is that the geological record absolutely does not reveal successive evolution. When I say successive evolution, I mean gradual changes, stair-step changes over time. It does not reveal that. Um, remember when, I, when we, we talked about those assumptions. The oldest layer is going to be the most undeveloped. The youngest layer is going to be the most evolved. As we dig into the geological column and we dig into the fossil record, what we find are fossils that are in the wrong places. They're showing up in places they have no business being. And I'm, I'm definitely going to say a bunch of names wrong here, but I want to... Uh, I want to try to give us an idea of some of these fossils. By the way, the guy that said fossils are turned up in the wrong places, that is a wooden raft, and it was in a scientific journal report. This is not just um, some creationist on a website going, oh, we're just going to put this information out. This is, a, this is an evolutionary believing report that says, hey, something's not right with where this fossil just showed up at. So what we have here is the fossil remains See if I can find the name of this because, like I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna mess it up. Um, pep, uh, Pipicids. You ever heard of that one? I have. Am I saying that one right? You think? It's close enough. Close enough. <laughs> pipicids. So pipicids are found in the upper car Carboniferous period. So if we're looking over here, I don't have Carboniferous period over here, but it's as if they're saying that we found up, up in this. Uh, like the, the early Paleocene area. They're, they're saying, we are, this is where we expect to find these. We expect to find these in the upper Carboniferous period. But lately, we've been discovering them in lower Cambrian. Lower Cambrian, all the way down here in the early Cambrians. There is a difference of, of sometimes hundreds to millions of years, uh, hundreds of thousands to millions of years in between where these animals are supposed to be found. Why are we finding remains of an animal that should not be all the way down in the lower Cambrian. It should be up higher. Uh, and and I'm, I've made, I think I've greatly exaggerated that, uh, that distance because I believe that Carboniferous was, was more closer to the Cambrian than that. But still, we're talking about, we're talking about hundreds of, of thousands of years in between the supposed. This fossil, which should be found here, we all of a sudden find it snaking its way down deeper into into Earth's history. Uh, and the fact that this is happening causes some, some issues. Uh, for one, the fact that the geological column, almost throughout, almost the entirety of it, contains oceanic fossils. Does anybody have an idea what that kind of reminds them of, by the way? Uh, so we've got a, a, like a, a the, the fossil is a, it looks like it's a bit of a cylindrical uh, surface. It's got a round mouth, like a worm, kind of like a worm. It is it is related to lampreys. It is very similar to a lamprey. A lamprey is a eel-like fish uh, that attaches itself and, and kind of like leeches feeds off of, of other other animals. Um, so this this uh, the pips is were kind of like lampreys. Uh, we're going to look at another one that was very similar to a lamprey in just a moment. But the fact that we're finding oceanic fossils throughout the geological column is a little bit strange. It's almost like the whole world was underwater at some point. Um, but also there's places where ocean fossils are mixed with land-dwelling fossils. And there's a doctor, Dr. Derek Agur. He is an evolutionist as well. He said it's very difficult to correlate, to explain marine and non-marine strata at this level. It's very hard for us to, to figure this out. But not only that, we find them mixed up. As if they're not all, you know, we should expect to find this fossil up here, but for some reason we're starting to find some of them even deeper down. Another one is this one right here. This is a agnathan. 
Uh, and agnathan was, is a, a type of fish, this is specifically called a jawless fish. It is similar to lampreys again, and that the way they feed. Um, there's some interesting things about this. Uh, and again, this is a visitor to the lower Cambrian region. This is a vertebrate. Now, a vertebrate is a creature that has a backbone. Backbones. This is not something that was expected to have been evolved by the Cambrian time. The, the, the Cambrian time, we we're expecting to see at this period mainly invertebrates. And the, the, the idea of vertebrates, which the earliest vertebrates are believed to have been fish, the earliest vertebrates should have evolved much later. Uh, the trilobite that I mentioned earlier, I showed a picture of trilobite, that's a vertebrate. That's another example of, of one that um, uh, you, you shouldn't be finding uh, as in, in these earlier areas. Um, we find a lot of invertebrates, I'm sorry, the trilobite is an invertebrate, I had that backwards. You find a lot of invertebrates uh, at, at, this, at this area, uh, down here in the lower Cambrian, because you don't expect that you will have had as many vertebrates evolve at this point. And yet, uh, in China, they've actually found several. They found several examples of these fish that were in this region where they shouldn't be. We, we expect to see fish later on because they haven't evolved yet in this earlier region. Um, another one that challenges the, uh, the geological column is this guy. And this, Miss Carol, I don't know how else to describe this skeleton. It looks like somebody took a dog <laughs> and a lizard, a gecko, and just smushed them together. Uh, this is called a Lystrosaurus. The Lystrosaurus is, um, I don't know, maybe it would have been the, the, the cute puppy of, of the day. Uh, but he poses a big problem for evolution. And that is the fossils of the Lystrosaurus, which are so common. We have so many fossil remains of this sort of, of this creature that in uh, places like South Africa, where they find a lot of them, paleontologists are, uh, what's the, not archaeologists, uh, or yeah, archaeologists, that's the right word. But paleontologists have quit picking them up. They just walk over these remains now. They have so many of them. It's like, it's like finding a penny on the road. You're like, I'm not even going to pick that penny up. There's just, maybe, maybe we do pick up pennies. But there are so many of these. There is no value in picking them up. But they've been finding them in places where they shouldn't expect to find them. Uh, the Lystrosaurus is also an uh, indexing fossil. Because they're so common, we say when we find Lystrosaurus, we know it's around this, this age right here. So whenever they discovered Lystrosaurus in the Permian region, they said something's not right about this. So the Permian region, uh, we should expect to find Lystrosaurus, I think that was up in uh, Triassic. We should expect to find the, up there, but we find remains of... Uh, source down here in the Permian uh, era, era of the column. Um, not only does this create a problem for dating the strata, because remember, source is an indexing column. So if, if we find this fossil, we know we're in this range. If we find it down in Permia, all of a sudden either Permia is not as old as we thought it was, or Lystrosaurus is older than we thought it was. But here's the problem it creates. The chain of evolving mammals, uh, or, or mammal-like reptiles. So we have this period of time where, in, in what we call the transitional period, even though we uh, are going to talk about that term in a moment, where we we have a reptile that seems like a mammal. And there is a lot about this animal that looks like reptile, reptilish. Uh, you know, the way its, its arms are flared out. You, can, you look at it, you can see a a uh, gecko or some of our, our lizards that we see today move in that way, but also it has some structures that make you wonder if it would have been uh, a mammal. But the Lystrosaurus is one of the key fossils in creating the chain of the evolution of mammal-like reptiles and moving it into a chronological sequence. This is what we use. We use this fossil. In other words, all of our assumptions of this organism are based off of evolutionary views, and our assumptions of other organisms are based off of this organism, 
And this one organism, everything that we assumed about it just got called into question because we expect for that to happen, for the, the process of evolution, for that to happen, it should be in this period up here. And that's where we've been finding them. And all of a sudden, we just found one much deeper, which means either it evolved faster or maybe evolution isn't happening. So whenever you bring these up, by the way, let me, let me say this before we go on. When you bring this up, this is not a smoking gun to evolutionists. And you have to remember that. Evolutionists have a bias towards evolution. We already accept that this is fact. So just bringing something like, well, okay, you expect, you accept that this is fact, then the fact that this indexing fossil to the Triassic period, it only exists in the Triassic period because it didn't exist before that because it hadn't evolved yet, and it just got found in the Permian period, does nothing to shake their view that evolution still occurred. The only thing it does is say, oh, well, we must have our timetables wrong. We need more time. We have to figure that out. So don't think that by, by saying this, you're going, oh, th this is just the, the, the smoking gun that's going to prove things wrong. It doesn't. Um, but moving this animal backwards in time does reveal that more mammal-like reptiles and less mammal-like reptiles didn't actually evolve from one another, but maybe lived at the same time. And that's something that they will struggle with. That, that is a struggle. If we're going to accept that they lived at the same time, then that's not a depiction of evolution. It's a depiction of a creature that just was here and then it died. Yeah. A creature that was kind of like a mammal and kind of like a reptile. What we want to use Lystrosaurus for is the missing link between mammals and reptiles. How did we get to mammal? Well, we started out as a reptile and slowly evolved into mammal. But if they're living at the same time, it's not that missing link anymore. It's a different species. It's a different kind. So that poses a problem. But uh, in 1992, J.J. Sapkowski, uh, who is a professed evolutionary paleontologist, he reported that in 10 years' time, so from 82 to 92, in 10 years' time, there were 1,026 fossil families that underwent an increase in their stratigraphic range. What that means is, just like these three that I've showed you, where we thought they were here, but then we found them, we found them older in older regions. I just brought up three. He said in '92, he said in the last 10 years, we found over a thousand of those, over a thousand fossils that experienced an increase. What that means is from 82 to 92, they found that they were much older than previously thought and oftentimes much older than evolutionary possible. And you might hear that and go, well, doesn't that prove that the Earth is much, much older than we thought? Maybe. But what it could also prove is that our assumptions on how we base time of these things is off because they're, they're proving to be not accurate. Another example of this, uh, I don't have the names of these, but in China, the remains of what appeared to be a, dog, a small dog were found. That doesn't really seem to be all that interesting, except for in the belly of that dog was what appeared to be a small dinosaur. <laughs> dog is, and at this, the, the interesting thing is in the, the strata, in the layer that they found this, at that period, we, we believe mammals existed but nothing larger than the size of a rodent. But all of a sudden we found something the size of a common dog, so you know, two and a half, three foot tall, that was able to eat a, a, a small dinosaur of some sort. Again, this once again causes evolutionary beliefs to have to be pushed back even further. And it complicates creatures further back that are gonna be used to prove the evolutionary process. I'm about to go a lot faster. So, our uh, next thing is that the geological and the fossil record absolutely do not show any transitional fossils. And just to show this really quickly, let me just quote a bunch of, of evolutionists. Uh, why is not every geological formation in every stratum full of intermediary links? 
uh, intermediate links. Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this is the most obvious and serious objection which cannot be urged, which can be urged against the theory. That was Charles Darwin. We said at the beginning, he was saying, I cannot wait to see all these. This is later, he's going, there are none. We have not found a single one. Why? Why is that? Stephen Benson, a paleozoologist in 1990, said paleontologists are traditionally famous or infamous for reconstructing whole animals from the debris of death, mostly they cheat. This is a guy who reckon, he believes in evolution. He was also calling attention to something that he, agreed, uh, he believed to be an egregious error in the community. We should not be doing this. We need to do it right. Uh, Jeffrey Schwartz, a professor of anthropology at the University of Pittsburgh in 99, said, instead of filling in the gaps in the fossil record with so-called missing links, most paleontologists found themselves facing a situation in which there were only gaps in the fossil record, with no evidence of transformational intermediates between documented fossil species. He also says that we are still in the dark about the origin of most major groups of organisms. I thought this was interesting. He said, they appear in the fossil record as Athena did from the head of Zeus. If you know anything about the, this mythology, Athena just appears fully formed. She's not a baby. She comes, she is born out of the head of Zeus as a, as a full-grown woman ready to make war with everybody. He says, in the fossil record, it appears as if animals just appeared, fully formed, ready to go, in contradiction to Darwin's depiction of evolution as resulting from the gradual accumulation of countless infinitesimal minute variations. Um, a guy named Henry Gee said no fossil is buried with its birth certificate. That and the scarcity of fossil means that it is effectively impossible to link fossils into chains of cause and effect in any valid way. To take a line of fossils and claim that they, are, that they represent a lineage is not a scientific hypothesis that can be tested, but an assertion that carries the same validity as a bedtime story. Amusing, perhaps instructive, but not scientific. Henry was a paleontologist and an evolutionary biologist. Uh, and then we also have Dr. Gould, uh, who was one of the most prolific evolutionists of the 20th century. He was also a paleontologist and an evolutionary biologist. He said the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as a trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and the nodes of their branches the rest is inference. It's reasonable, but it is not evidence of the fossils. What he's saying is all that we know about the fossil record says that these fossils appeared fully formed, and there is nothing that links them back to some more simple, less complex underdevelopment. The transitional fossils simply do not exist. So we are going to run out of time before I think we finish all of this. So I want to just go really quickly over the Cambrian explosion because we still have a lot that I want to get to in this quarter. Um, the Cambrian explosion is this time right here uh, in the, the period of 488 million to 542 million years ago. So, so 500, uh, uh, what about, about 80 million years. About 80 million years, this time period where... Um, not even that, about 60 million years, right? Yeah, about 60 million years. We have this time period where all of these creatures just came out of nowhere. We have all of these fossil records that appear relatively suddenly in the grand scheme of things. 80 million years compared to billions of years, rather suddenly. And some interesting things have occurred. Let me get my, my notes on this guy right here. So, we have a fossil here. Can anybody tell me what they think that's a fossil of? Ms. Carol, it's got uh, very, very long arms, and it appears to have uh, possibly some, some long fingers. Um, it's got legs and feet, and it's got a very small tail. Kind of looks like this thing flew. What do y'all think that is? That looks like a reptile that flies. Okay, so Robbie says a reptile that flies. This is actually a mammal. A flying mammal. It's a bat. This is the remains. This is a, a fossil of a bat. And let's see if I can find this bat. The oldest fossils of bats have been given a geological age of 50 
million years. And they are found in Germany. And here's what's interesting about this bat. This bat is exactly like the bats that we have today. They have, 50 million years ago, they were, uh, they had inner ears that used sonar for detection, for, for, for finding their ways around, for finding food. They look identical to our, to the bats that we have today. Size may be a little bit different. Um, these bats appear in the fossil record and show zero evolutionary change in 50 million years. Now, sometimes people will bring up this bat, which was recently found. You can find, there was a, a bit on ABC News. This bat looks a little bit different. It has a much longer tail than our bats have. And it does not have a, a pronounced inner ear that uses sonar. This bat did not have echolocation. And they say, this is an example. It is older. It is, it is dated older than that previous bat. This is an example of evolution, except <laughs> we have bats today. That is a very big bat, by the way. This is called a mega bat. <laughs> and the mega bat does not use echolocation. It hunts only off of eyesight and smell. And it coexists with bats that do. Showing not an evolutionary trait, an evolutionary uh, growth, but showing instead species of different kinds living together as if they were created. In fact, that's what the Cambrian explosion suggests. It's as if the earth is saying, I was, I was created. I was not here and then I was here. When you go back before the Cambrian time period, you don't find very many fossils. The ones that you do are fossils of algae or bacteria, things that may have been created at the beginning of creation. But you don't start seeing real plant life. You don't start seeing animal life until all of a sudden at the Cambrian explosion. All of this comes into effect. So just really, really quickly, what do we find? We find no transitional record. Throughout the geological layers, we find complex and simple um, organisms living together. We find different types at different places, suggesting that some died and had past events, but they all came at one sudden point in the geological column. All of the assumptions that we had for creation are shown to be true in the geological column. It is the greatest tool. It is what the evolutionists say, this is our only hope. And almost everything that it says, says creation is what happened. Guys, thank you all so much. Uh, I have one last uh, thing on there. It was Psalm 19. Psalm 19 says that creations declare the glory of God. I would have to say that's a great place to end the class on. Amen. <laughs>